Welcome to the program today. This is Pastor Silva Mundley. And this is Catherine Mundley. We have a powerful series on the book of Revelation, Catherine. So okay. get ready to be mesmerized. The book of Revelation is not so difficult to understand. It is a simple book to understand. It's made difficult by a whole lot of assumptions. We're going to get to the core of it. You're going to learn about Jesus Christ. You're going to learn about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. You're going to learn about coming events. And we are going to share with you stuff you've never heard of before. It's all in the book of Revelation. So get ready as we go into the program right now. Jesse, if you can read the last part, uh, uh, where Jesus holds up the stars and the, the, stars and the candlesticks. Uh, if you can read that again, and uh, I want to just pick from there and then go into chapter 2. Revelation 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches mm -hmm. and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Right, so what we learned last week, we learned about Paul, uh, sorry, uh, John being on the island of Patmos. We spoke about what Patmos is, why he's there. We spoke about why it's John. And we spoke about what the book of Revelation is about, the three major sections in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and then we also spoke about uh, the vision that John had of Jesus. And this is exactly what Jesus looks like today. Many people have pictures of Jesus, images and drawings of Jesus. But we understand from the Bible that this is what Jesus looks like right now. So if you were to go to heaven, uh, probably this is what you would see. You would not see uh, uh, the Jesus that you watch in the movies, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, got, you have this image of Jesus, and it's, it's really come from a, 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 an alleged burial cloth that has an a, a imprint of the, of the face of Jesus. And people have taken that imprint and believes and believed for many, uh, many, many years mm -hmm. that this is what Jesus looks like. So all the pictures you see, he has a beard and generally he has long hair and things like that. Well, uh, uh, that's, the, that's what you see in the movies. That's what you see in the book of Matthew, the, uh, the book of uh, John and, and the book of uh, the gospel going to Peter and so on. Well, you see that in those movies and people think when they get to heaven, that's the Jesus they're going to see. He's going to look just like them. Mm. Now, well, John here tells us exactly what Jesus looks like because Jesus appears before him and he's a completely different picture. Now, is, is we understand Jesus is holding in his hand the angels and is, is surrounded by the candlesticks. And he explains that the, uh, what the angels are and he explains what the candlesticks are. And last week I explained to you that the angels that he's speaking about, the messengers he's speaking about, are not the angels that you find in heaven or the, you know, the angels that we know about. Mm -hmm. the, the, the original scripture there tells us that he's actually holding in his hands the seven pastors of the seven congregations in Asia Minor. Where is Asia Minor? Asia Minor is in uh, Western Turkey today, right? It's in Turkey. And, uh, and uh, this is where the seven churches of Revelation were in. And why is he holding the pastors of the church? Well, I explained to you why it's not the apostles or the prophets or the evangelists or the teachers and why it's the pastors. Because the role of a pastor is different from all the other ones. And, uh, and, and if I just do it in, in two minutes and explain to you why he's holding the pastor and, and, and he's surrounded by the congregations and why the pastor is so important here. Remember that, that the role of a pastor is different from every other person, every other man or woman of God that will come into your life. Your senior pastor's role is completely different from everyone else's role. You'll meet many prophets, many evangelists. Many apostles, many wonderful, mighty men of God, many people you watch on television, but they, they do not have the influence that your senior pastor has on your eternity. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, there are two judgments for every, every believer. There's two judgments we know in the Bible, and uh, uh, one is the great white throne, and the other judgment is the bema. Now, at the bema, you will not be judged if you gave your life to Jesus or not. The fact that you got the bema means... Mm -hmm that you're going to get into heaven. And that's great news. But the only judgment that actually happens in the Bema is what rewards or crowns do you get for eternity? What rewards or crown? The Bible talks about many rewards and also several crowns are listed in the Bible. And you have that for eternity. The Bible says that in heaven, 
uh, there'll be many occupations and many things that we will be rewarded with. One of the things the Bible talks about is some of us will be ruling towns, some of us cities, some of us countries, some of us even continents, and, and so on. And there's many various rewards and roles that we're going to have and many uh, blessings that we're going to have for eternity. Now, who influences those blessings is important. Who, who makes the final, final decision what you get? It's God. He decides what blessings you get. But who directly influences the blessings that you get? It's your pastor that does that. Wait, where, where is that in Scripture? The Bible says that uh, uh, honor those that, that, that watch over you. Honor your pastor and, and don't make their lives hard because that will not be profitable for you. It won't be a benefit to you. Then it says that your pastor has to give an account for your life. So where does he give an account for your life? And how come it's profitable or not profitable? Well, he gives an account of, of your life, a spiritual account of your life at the Bema, at the Bema. And why is it profitable? Because if the account that he gives, if the testimony he gives about you is a very good testimony, then that influences the rewards that you get. That's how it's profitable, mm. right? And, 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 you know, there are some people, and I'm, and, 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 and I'm just saying this generally, some people are not going to get a good, a good report, you know. Uh, some pastors can get up and say, well, I was just glad that they left my church, you know. Someone else is going to say, well, they, they gave me a hard time. They slandered me. They gossiped about me. They always fought me. And that's the report that that, uh, uh, that, that, that man or woman of God is going to get uh, from their pastor. Some pastors are going uh, 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 to give uh, really... Uh, uh, nasty reports. Remember, the pastor can't lie at the Bema. There's the one thing he'll not be able to do is lie about you at the Bema. He can lie at, the, at your funeral, but he can't lie at the Bema uh, uh, because he's before God and he's been judged on what he's saying and God obviously knows those things, but the pastor has to give a report. Um, I know in my church, I'm going to give a lot of great reports and a lot of wonderful people that I have around me, people that pray for me all the time, people always uh, encouraging me, working alongside me for the vision of the church, uh, people always uh, uh, encouraging, supporting, blessing, uh, 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 people who have really, really, really uh, brought so much of joy into my life as a pastor. When I get to the beam, I, I won't be able to wait to give a good report mm. about them. And, 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 and that's the report the Bible is talking about. And, and based on the report, God will then decide what he wants to bless them with. Now, uh, that's why you should always watch. You should always watch. And the one person you should always be careful that you're always praying for and upholding is your pastor. Somebody will say, well, I won't have the problem because I, had, I haven't been to church uh, for six months or, or 10 years or whatever. Well, that's the report your pastor's going to give. Someone else is going to say, well, you know, I belong to a mega church. My pastor doesn't know me. I'm just a number. That's the report you're going to get from your pastor <laughs> before the beamer, right? So uh, this is the reason why Jesus holds these seven pastors of these churches in his hand because they are directly connected uh, to the destiny of the church. And, 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 uh, and there's much more that we can talk about that. We've spoken a lot about it on, on the last episode. Let's now get to the seven churches. There are seven churches that Jesus now, the seven candle stands represent seven churches in Asia Minor. Jesse, what are the names of those churches? If you can give it to me quickly. The first church, which is Ephesus. Right. The second church. By the way, Ephesus was uh, whose church? John's, John's church. church. Yeah, right. His church. Remember, Ephesus is actually the closest to Patmos. When you look at the 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 uh, map, mm -hmm. Ephesus is the closest to Patmos, and and that was John's church. Now, what's? Uh, give me those churches quickly, if you will. Okay, so it's Ephesus, it's Smyrna, it is Pergamum, Pergamum, and then we have Thyatira, we have Sardis. And we have Laodicea, Laodicea and right. Philadelphia. Philadelphia, right? So there are seven churches there that that uh, Jesus gives a prophecy over. Now, there's some very important things that you must understand about chapter two and chapter three of the book of Revelation. Yes. It's absolutely critical that you understand what's been taught by Jesus, what's been prophesied by Jesus in chapter two and chapter three of the book of Revelation. Well, why is it absolutely important? Firstly, this message 
that Jesus gives to the seven churches, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to now talk about it in modern terms. It's kind of like an email that's to all the churches. It's one email to all the churches, and in different parts of the email, it's to specific groups in different locations. So what is, for example, to Pergam, uh, uh, to Sardinia, to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. but everybody reads the same email. So everybody reads what Jesus is saying about their church and also what Jesus is saying about the other churches. Mm -hmm. So it's a group email and it's for everyone to read and everyone gets to read it and it is for the churches in the different locations. Now, second thing to remember is this, is that many of those churches did not exist in the time the, this prophecy was given. Okay, several of those churches did not exist. Right? They only came about later. But Jesus gives the prophecy to John for all the churches. Third thing to remember is that this prophecy that he gives is not a prophecy that was for the churches 2,000 years ago. It's for somebody else. It's for the church. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 is a prophecy, is a, is a message from Jesus for every single church on the planet. For every single church on the planet. In other words, your church in 2020, your church in 2020 is one of those seven churches. One of the seven churches. It might be a combination of churches. These seven churches, the messages sent to the churches, is not just for the church, it's also for the congregation inside the church. So you could be one particular type of church, but you can have three different types of congregations according to the seven types that Jesus gives you. So these seven churches... Although he said to John, write it to the church, and John may have wondered, why? There is no church there. How come he's giving me this message? Mm -hmm. It is a prophetic message for the body of Christ. So your church, your church that you go to is in these seven churches. And your walk with God, the congregation, is also in these seven churches. So you can have different kinds of congregations in one church, and you'll also have one of seven types of churches or a combination of churches. Uh, you may ask me, Pastor, well, which one is your church? My church is Philadelphia, by the way. It's uh, when, you, when we come to the church in Philadelphia, that's what the Miracle Center is like. We have a little bit of the other good parts of the other churches, but that's who we are. Now, your church, you're going to find your church in these seven churches. Now, you're also going to find what Jesus has to say about your church and what he has to say about your walk. There is warnings that Jesus gives about our walk, and we need to take heed to this because there's consequences to not understanding Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 because it is a, it is a prophecy mm -hmm. for the body of Christ in 2020. It's a prophecy for the eternal church. Now, some people have, 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 uh, uh, have taught and they've taught wrong about this because they, there is no foundation to, to, to their, to their uh, teaching or doctrine. But they have taught that the church has evolved uh, from one type to the next, to the next, to the next, according to the seven churches. So in other words, it went from Ephesus to uh, Smyrna, and then the church evolved to the next church, evolved to the next church. Well, that is not what the prophecy is about, mm. and we don't have now one type of church. We have a combination of these seven churches, amen? And you belong to these seven churches, amen? So these are actual group of believers in 2020, and this is a prophetic message from Jesus Christ to you in 2020, Amen. He used, he used the seven churches as a foundation for his prophecy to the eternal church. Amen. These are letters written to the churches, but it's for, and the reason why he wrote it as a collective letter is because you would need to find which church you are 
and you would need to find which church you attend in these letters. So that's why it wasn't separated, but it was collective uh, letters. Amen. Amen. Right. So each letter opens as the church uh, in that city. So there are seven cities here. Again, it's in the western part of Turkey today. And these were seven cities in Asia Minor. Uh, some of them had congregations. Some of them did not have congregations. And the, and the letter was written well ahead. But uh, these seven churches, it's so interesting, Jesse. Mm. They were within reach of Patmos. Yes. Right? They were right near Patmos. So you could travel from Patmos in a day or so to these different, these different towns. Churches. Those different towns. So the first thing to understand is that he opens discussing a certain church and uh, discussing a church in a city. So he starts with the city and he refers to the church in that city. The second part of these letters is a description of Christ in that church. And how Christ is being worshipped worship in, in that, that church, church, right? The third one is a commendation and uh, from God. And, and in other words, it's like a, it's like a well done thing, well done, a, pack in, mm. uh, a, a pat on the back, right? And then... Uh, uh, this approval is then followed by discipline. Mm. There is first a commendation, and then there is condemnation. Uh, saying, hey, you know what? You guys did all this good stuff. Thumbs up for it. Mm. But there is something that you're not doing right. Okay? So there's condemnation, which is the fourth element, right? And some of the churches are very seriously yes. criticized by Christ. Jesus criticizes the Christians. More, more chastising not them. Chastises the Christians, and he does it very severely, mm -hmm. right? Very severely. Um, uh, uh, but in two of the, of the letters, mm. there's no disapproval. And yeah. one of them is Philadelphia, Philadelphia. right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I chose Philadelphia. <laughs> anyway, so, so we start off firstly, we start off firstly, uh, he opens identifying the church in the city. Mm. Number two, he talks about the kind of church it is. Yes. Number three, he commends them for all the good works they've done and so on. Mm. Number four, he condemns them for the wrong. Yeah. Number five, after the evaluation, he gives them direction. He yes. gives them counsel, what they need to do to fix it, mm. right? And then finally, he ends the letter with a challenge. Jesus urges the believers to new levels of obedience and faithfulness. So when we read uh, uh, these, these, these letters, Jesse, mm. uh, they are to be taken very seriously. Yeah, I see it as a very honest evaluation right. of Jesus oh, for every church. And of today's church. Of today's church. Of and the church that you may be a member of, mm. the church you may be a pastor of, the church where you may be a leader at, and it's an evaluation of the congregation of mm. the church. Amen? Uh, uh, so the seven churches represents seven kinds of Christians in yes, every, in church. every church. Right? So true. Right? Seven kinds so of Christians true. in every church. So this is a letter from Jesus, a prophecy from Jesus. And um, so in some cases, he's giving approval to the churches. Mm. And uh, other cases, he's giving correction to the churches. He knows each church right. so well. Now, the thing that's very important here in the seven letters is that if you ignore the prophetic word of Jesus, there is a consequence. Yeah. In fact, there was a consequence to the churches that disobeyed. One of the churches that disobeyed mm. Jesus is the first church, the church in Ephesus. Ephesus yes. So when they got this letter, it was an established church. Remember I said to you, some of the churches were not yet established. Mm. There was no churches there, but Ephesus, Ephesus was an was established there. church, and the pastor of Ephesus was... John, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and um, the church in Ephesus, when they got this letter, they repented. They repented. But what happened is that as time went by, a new generation took over the running of the church. Mm -hmm. This generation went back. And because they went back, the church in Ephesus was destroyed. Mm -hmm. They went back to their old Yes, sins. what the prophecy that Jesus gave, the consequence he gave, Yes. Came to pass in the Ephesus church. So when God said, I will remove the lampstand, I will remove the church it, it, from you. The lampstand was removed. It was actually closed. It was closed. The church actually, you see, when he says, I'll remove the lampstand, you know, what is a lampstand? It gives light, right? Yeah. So let's go back to modern terminology. Mm. It's like Jesus saying, I'll take all the bulbs out of your light fittings. If I take the bulbs out, 
and you switch the lights on, it's darkness. Mm. In other words, you no more light in the city and you, you will then be extinguished. So you no longer, you'll cease to be a church. Mm. So that was the, the, that's what, that was what Jesus said to the church. The second generation yes. of those in Ephesus, they went back doing the wrong things yes, that the that previous generation had repented of. Mm. That church got, to, the light of the church went dead. That church actually died, it broke up. And there was see. no longer a church in Ephesus, right? Because sure. they didn't obey the book of Revelation, chapters two and three, mm. what Jesus was saying to the church. So it's a very important part, two and three. It is a, now say this with me. It is a now word. It is a now word. So the book of Revelation broke up to three parts. The, the second part is the now word, what God is saying now. Mm. The third part of the book of Revelation is what is to come, right? What is to come. Yes. So there's an introduction, what the book is all about, mm. right? The word now for the church mm. and mm. the word of what's going to come later on. So from chapters four onwards, right to the end of the book of Revelation, mm. is all about what is to come. It hasn't yes. come, it is to come. From chapter two and three, it is what God is saying right now on the 15th of July, 2020 what he's saying to you and what he's saying to every Christian, what he's saying to every church. church. Amen. So you guys have that, right? Uh, you, you have an understanding. Jesse, anything you want to say there? Um, I believe it is the time. It is the time to take an evaluation of our own lives because Jesus is very serious about what he's saying. Amen. The word of God says that Jesus is the truth. The word of truth became flesh and walked dwelt amongst us and wherever Jesus went, he kept saying the word of God. He kept saying, repent, right? right. Uh, remember John the Baptist, was. Uh, right. he kept on saying repent because right. the word was coming. Yeah. So God is saying the same thing. Repent, I'm coming. Right. Repent, I'm coming. Evaluate your life and go and check those little things you haven't dealt with, perhaps in the past and you pushed it away for a time, mm. uh, you know, in the future. Amen. I believe that it is time now that we should fix it and listen to what God is saying tonight, amen? Amen, amen. So we're going to look at verses, Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start with the first church. Yes. And I want you to read from verses 1 to 7. Right? To the angel of the church of Ephesus. Stop right there. Who is it addressed to? To the angel or the pastor of the church. Well, the angel is the pastor of the church, <laughs> right? Why is it not addressed to a physical angel? Because no angel as accountability for any church. Mm. You know, when, when you give accountability, that means there are consequences, right? So if, if, if for example, uh, you are given accountability for uh, baking the cake, right? That's <laughs> you accountable for that, right? And, and, uh, and the cake gets burnt, then there are consequences, you know. You're going to get some very upset people. You're going to have to maybe go and rebake the cake or whatever, but you're going to have to fix it. So there's consequences. Angels, however, don't have consequences. Right? Yeah. And no angel runs any church. We all know that. The head of the church is the Holy Spirit. So the original word here says to the messenger, messenger. who is the pastor yes. of the church. Yes. So to the senior pastor of the, not the apostle, mm. Not the prophet, not the evangelist, evangelist. or the teacher. Yeah. To the senior pastor of the church in Ephesus. Right. So the letter is addressed to the pastor. Yes. But again, as I said to you, it is a group mail. And because it's a group mail, the pastor gets the letter, mm -hmm. but everybody gets to hear the contents of the letter. Yes. So everybody gets to hear what every pastor is being told <laughs> about their church. Yes. Right? So, go for it, Jesse. So, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, uh -huh. who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, mm -hmm. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Mm -hmm. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, mm -hmm. and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored my namesake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, 
from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, mm -hmm. or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, mm -hmm. unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, mm -hmm. which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm -hmm. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. So, he starts off by saying who he's talking. He says, mm. this is the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Yes. So, this message, uh, a church that you are getting, is coming directly from Jesus Christ. Mm. It's not coming from any man or any preaching, any sermon. It's coming directly from Jesus Christ. He says, he starts off by saying, I know your deeds mm. and I know your hard work and your perseverance. Wow. So let's first start with Ephesus and then we're going to go through this prophecy that Jesus gives. Now you're going to be surprised by what you're going to hear about the church in Ephesus mm. because many of you watching me are going to say, that's us. We are that church. Yeah. So watch, follow. Ephesus, by the way, was a very important city. It was a major city in Asia Minor. It was kind of like the New York mm. of the ancient world. The big business went on there. You can make it there. You mm. know, uh, and everybody flocked there. Everybody flocked yeah. there. There was wealth. There was lots of money in Ephesus. Yes. There was power in Ephesus. Uh, there was uh, influence. And of course, there was the good life as well. Yes. Right? All was in Ephesus. Ephesus had it all, but the great thing is Ephesus had a church, amen, <laughs> a good church, an active church, right? Not a dead church, an active church. Yes. And, and any Christian, any Christian would have been proud to be a member of that church in Ephesus, mm. okay? Because Jesus commends the church for four things. He says four things. He says, he talks about their activity, right? He says, I know your deeds, your hard work. Wow, I know your deeds. I know your deeds, your hard works. You know what Jesus is saying? That these Christians in Ephesus, guys, you have worked so hard for the gospel. You have toiled mm. for the gospel to the point of, of, of being exhausted. Wow. I mean, you went out, you worked, uh, uh, and you gave everything. You were up early in the morning. Mm. You were, 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 were working for God the whole day. Remind me kind of like my, my uh, production department. Yes. They work seven days a week. And they sometimes they work till one, two in the morning. Yes. Sometimes all night long and they're producing episodes. You know, uh, 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 I did a count this morning. We produced every month 60 half an hour episodes a month. Six zero. Wow. 60 episodes a month for television, 60. Each episode is half an hour long, and one person edits all 60 episodes. One person does Q&A of all 60 episodes. Plus, there is, a, there is also a social media department. Yes. But we produce 60 episodes. In other words, we produce 15 episodes of Your Miracle Moment every week for various television networks around the world. And that's how hard our people in production work. So they really work to the point of exhaustion. Mm. They work long hours. And, and not dedicated. just, and that includes us and, and Je Pastor Jesse as well, because we all four are part of the team as well, on the production team. And of course, we have our daughter, Raquel, who is also part of the social media team that works, works very close with us as well. So, uh, 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 so you must understand, Jesus is saying, wow, 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 <laughs> I know your deeds. I know how you work for me. I mean, I know yeah. that you toil to the point of being exhausted. Mm. And uh, you don't wait for someone to tell you what yes. to do. You're on the ball. You're doing it. You're always yeah. working hard. And the next thing he says, he says, this church in Ephesus has lots of workers. Yeah. Everybody in the church is actively involved in ministry. That's what he's saying. Uh, uh, they're not looking to be entertained. Mm. Uh, they want to be in the trenches. They want to be touching lives. So they are working hard. They are, they are, they are, some of them are going out evangelizing. Mm. Some of them are ministering to the sick. Some of them are taking care of community needs and, and uh, uh, helping the poor, helping the destitute. Uh, the, everybody is active. 
actively involved in ministry. They're phoning visitors. They are counseling people. They're praying for the sick. Every one of them are passionately involved in ministry. This is the Ephesus church. Mm. And maybe this is your church. Maybe this is who you are. You are actively involved in ministry, right? So number one, he talks about their activity. Number two, he talks about their purity. This is what he says. Uh, he praises them for the purity. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, right? He says, I know you can't tolerate nonsense, right? The Christians in Ephesus were not afraid to deal with uh, moral impurity in the church. You know, unlike the church in Corinth, in Corinth, it was everything goes. You know? yeah. <laughs> everything goes. No one told you what you were doing was yeah, wrong. You know, you were, yeah, they, they just kept quiet. The pastor saw you doing something wrong. He saw you living in sin. He saw you doing some uh, wrong deeds. He just kept quiet, mm. right? But of course, he would be judged for that later on. Because if you're a pastor and you see wrong and you don't call it out, you are severely judged for that. Remember, it's better to be an evangelist than to be a pastor. It's better to be an apostle or a prophet than to be a pastor. It's better to be a teacher than to be a pastor. Because as a pastor, when you're a pastor, you are judged much more severe than any other Christian. Because all your actions are judged. And if you are not a bold person, you are judged for that. Think of Eli yes. and his sons. Eli was judged because of his sons. Because Eli was not bold enough to correct them. And when you're a pastor and you have a quiet personality, you can't talk, then you're not really called, you're not ready to be a pastor. Mm. To be a pastor, you have to be someone that is firm, someone who speaks with authority and someone who fixes things. But if you're too afraid of people, then you should be a junior pastor or an associate pastor or you should be involved in another part of the ministry. Yeah. You can't be a lead pastor if, you if you're are, timid. If you're timid. Yeah. Simple as that. You cannot be because you will be judged severely when you come before God. Right? You'll be judged severely for that. So a pastor has to be someone who's outspoken. You're not everybody's friend. People won't, in the church won't like you sometimes because you speak so directly and you say things the way they are. But, but that's what makes you a pastor. That's what God expects of you. Yeah. So in this church here, he commended them for this. He said, listen, guys, when you see anything wrong, mm -hmm. any nonsense, you stop it, you speak about it, you expose it, right? That's what he said. He said, I'm so proud of you for that. I'm mm -hmm. so proud of you guys in, 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 in Ephesus for this, right? And, and he what he says. He says that uh, there were people who came out of line and you confronted them with humility and grace. Yes. Uh, you were not looking to kick people out of the church, but you wanted to restore them with holiness and obedience. Yes. So the Ephesus church is any is a, uh, in any age or in any place has a concern for holiness. So when you're a church and holiness is important, it's very important to you, then you're an Ephesus type church. You're an Ephesus type church, right? You are, and God loves that. He loves it when he sees holiness coming from the pulpit, mm -hmm. holiness coming from the believers. Mm -hmm. They walk his holy and they stand up for holiness. He loves that, right? Not for condemnation, but for holiness, holiness, right? Number three, and uh, number three, Jesus commends their loyalty to him and to the truth of God's word, mm. right? So these are people that read the word, understood the word. Dress. They were yes. doctrinally sound. sound. Church, right? And, and when, some Peter, when some teachers showed up and claimed that they were apostles of Jesus who spoke with Jesus' authority, these Christians didn't just take their word for it. Just mm. because they saw... God used them to prophesy or heal the sick or, or because they were great preachers. They just didn't follow what they said. Mm. They went back and tested it against the word, right? Wow. And so if you're an Ephesus-style church, uh, God's word will be central to everything you do. Everything is based on what the Bible teaches. It is the foundation of all your actions. So it's the foundation of your behavior. Mm. It's the foundation of your passion. It's the foundation of your holiness. It's the word of God. And so they were commended for their loyalty to the word of God. You see, when you follow the word, God says you are loyal to me. When you, when you walk with the word, he calls it loyalty. He calls it loyalty. Now, uh, Jesse, let's go back. I want to pick up on these points I just discussed. Will you read again? I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. 
Right. And Perfect. you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, yes. and have found them liars. Watch that. So a lot of people came to you and said, I'm apostle so-and-so, I'm apostle so-and-so, and, -so, and, and they I have said, this word for you. And I, or I'm prophet so-and-so, and I have a word for you, and so on. And they said, are you really apostle? Who ordained you? Who commissioned you as an apostle? What evidence do you have that you are an apostle? See, an apostle must have evidence. The evidence that you are really an apostle is this. You must operate in the anointing. You must operate in the presence. And you must operate in the glory. You must operate in all three dimensions. You must operate in miracles. You have to operate in miracles. You have to, and not once in, a, in, in six years. It must be a daily occur. Every time you're ministering, miracles must take place. The gifts of the Spirit must manifest. And signs and wonders should be happening as well. So those three things must happen. If there's no power, no evidence of the supernatural, then you can't, you can give yourself the title, but this church here mm -hmm. judged those people that gave themselves a title. You see, I was commissioned, you and I were commissioned, you know, uh, we don't use a lot of our titles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I actually don't like to use titles, but about 10 years ago, I was uh, ordained as a bishop of yes. the apostolic church. I was commissioned as, an, both of us were commissioned as apostles, mm -hmm. by one of the biggest apostolic movements in the, in the world today under uh, Apostle Maldonado. Uh, we, you know, we... Uh, 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 we have all these titles, but we yes. don't use them. I actually don't like to use titles too much. If you just call me Pastor Sava, I'm so happy. That's my greatest title. Yes, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right. But just for you to understand that there were people that came, they said, I'm apostle so-and-so, I'm prophet so-and-so, and this church didn't just listen to their prophecy, it judged whether they were truly a prophet or not, whether they were truly an apostle or not. And Jesus commends them. Yes. He says, well done, well done that you just don't let anyone influence your mm. destiny. That you check out the person to check out if this, if this is authentic or not. You don't just go with every wind, mm. with every message you get on, on, on social media and run with that message, but you go and check out the facts. You check against the word of God. That's what this church did. Carry on. Yeah, truly commendable. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have persevered and have patience. Right. And have labored for my name's sake and Patience, have not become weary. Labored? Yes. Not become weary, carry on. You have persevered, you have patience, you have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. Praise God. Those are the points Jesus says, yes. Amen, amen. And uh, later, okay, well, well, let's go to it because later on he talks about the, uh, the uh, Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. Yes. And I'm going to tell you who they are and, uh, and something very powerful mm. in that statement that Jesus makes there about them. Yes. Right? So let's go on. So, uh, and then he commends them for their rock-solid consistency. He says, guys, you have been uh, uh, consistent in your walk. You've been consistent Christians. You, this is what he said. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name uh, and have not grown weary. You didn't give up. You kept on persevering. Your mm. faith was strong. Your faith is strong. You kept on persevering. Kept on pace of persevering. And Jesus loves that in a church. Yes. He loves a church that doesn't quit. He loves a Christian that doesn't quit. He loves a Christian that will keep persevering. So the Ephesians had held their ground under persecution. Because remember, yes. the Ephesian church was being persecuted by the Romans, but they held their ground. Mm. They said no. They said no. Uh, so instead of, uh, uh, instead of wiping all out the church, opposition from the world just made the church stronger. Yeah, and they right? grew even bigger. Yes. That's powerful, very powerful, and Jesus loves that. Right. So if you, let's just say you, you could go in a time machine and go to the church in Ephesus, you would take one look at that church and you would say, <laughs> this is my kind of church. This is the church. I want to become a member of this church. I want to be in the church in Ephesus, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, this is my home. You will say, this is my spiritual home. They were active. They were biblically based. They were loyal to Jesus. They were rock solid. Uh, you wouldn't have sensed anything wrong in that church, right? Mm. And, and, but remember that Jesus is the one yeah, that walks sees. among the churches and he sees beyond everything we do, mm. he sees the heart, the heart right? Yes. So, but, but I believe that a lot of people that work so hard here must have been really genuine what they were doing. Yes, right? exactly. They must be genuine. So he sees what's hidden from the eyes and, and this is Jesus' evaluation. Now, we heard all the good things about the Ephesus church. Mm -hmm. Some of you are saying, that's me, that's our church, that's who we are. Now, Jesus says, let me give you an evaluation that is from heaven. And I want you to listen to this. In verse 4. 
Verse 4, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Read that for me again, Jesse. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Wow. He says, although you are, you, you are persevering, although you are, you are working so hard, you are passionate about the word, although you, you do all this ministry work, mm. you are so actively involved in ministry, actively involved in preaching the gospel, actively involved in doing good. Although all these things are there, although it's there, there is one problem with you, one problem that is so critical, one problem. And you know what's the problem? It says you have left your first love. You've left the love, the first loves. He sees a church falling out of love with him. He says your hearts have cooled down. Your hearts have cooled down. So you have accelerated in ministry, but your heart has decelerated from me. That's what he's saying, right? The fire of pure devotion. So these guys, I mean, they, they were holy. Yes, they, they knew the they, word. They knew the word. They didn't take any nonsense. Yeah, they, they weren't were, gullible. They were not gullible, right? And they, were, they persevered. They were not Very quitters. Hard workers, yes. right? They worked hard to exhaustion. I mean, they, if the church was doing a crusade, they were, they there, were there three hours early to yeah. help set up. They put up the tent. They went out. They prayed for the people. Mm. They took their names down. They went and did home visitation. Yes. They went and yeah. counseled them for hours. I mean, they, they came home exhausted from mm. ministry. They were passionate about what they were doing. But Jesus says, in all the passion you have, for the church, where is your passion for me? You see, but hold on, isn't it the same thing? No. no He's saying, you love ministry. You do ministry. But you have forgotten your first love. I am your first love. It's like, it's like a couple, right, in a relationship. And, and the husband is saying, but I do so much of things for you. Mm. I mean, I, I, I work hard. I bring in the money. I take you on vacation. I'm always yeah. buying you gifts. Yes. I'm giving you clothes. I'm clothing you. I'm clothing the children. I'm doing A, B, C, yeah. D, E, F. I'm the greatest husband you can ever have. And the wife says, do, but do you still love me? Yeah. Because you drink so much, but you're no longer there as a husband. Do you still love me? See, this is what Jesus is asking the Christians. He's saying, do you still love me? I mean, where's your first love? Where's the first love? Yeah, you're praying, you're worshiping and so on, but where's your first love? It's not there. It's not there. It's missing. So he says, he says the fire of pure devotion is going on. I mean, you're devoted. You're on fire. You're on fire. <laughs> and, uh, but Jesus' concern, he holds us against them. He says, listen, guys, maybe in light of all this criticism, we need to reevaluate Jesus' comments here because it's so yeah. important. And we need to look more cl closely at our own church and at our lives right now, right? The church in Ephesus was a hardworking church. Mm. It was on fire for God. Yes. On fire for God, right? <laughs> Their work was simply, uh, but, but their work was a performance oh, that they did. Yes. It was a performance. The services were well planned. Their praise and worship was excellent. Mm. I mean, the pews were packed. The ushers were there. The deacons were there. The pastor's sermon was bam, man. Wow. He, you know, he screamed. He ran. He, he shouted. People said, "Amen." They, they, they came and did everything. Everything was was well polished and well yes. groomed, right? But Jesus says, "I miss the first love yeah. you had." He misses the extravagance of love poured out. He misses the spontaneous mm. worship. He misses the love that needed to be the center. You know, many years ago, when we arrived in Johannesburg, and we live in Johannesburg, and I'm talking about something like 20 years ago. Mm. So we went to a church, a big church. To, so this was a church in Randburg, quite a well-known church. We went in there, and when we got into the church, we said, well, it's another church, and we'll just get in there, mm. and we'll go see what the church is like, And because we were looking for a church when we came yeah. up to Johannesburg. And so we get to this church, and we, when we get in, uh, we noticed, firstly, we were the only people of color in the church. And, yes. and I'm talking about now, uh, post-apartheid, right? 
And uh, this is a church in Randburg. But that didn't bother us because we believe we were part of one body. But we got to the church and we felt completely out of place. Uh, they were doing everything. They were doing praise and worship and, yeah. and all the acts of being an excellent church. But there was no love. There was no connection to anyone. Mm. You know, even the pastor uh, greeted everybody, looked at our name, looked at us, and then he ignored us and went to the next person on the list. <laughs> right? So <laughs> I'm just telling you what happened. And even after the church, after the service, someone came up to us and says, you know, I'm so-and-so, I introduced myself, I've got your card, and, you know, it's my duty to come home, and mm -hmm. I have to do that to visit you. And, and so she made it seem like it's a, it's a responsibility, it's a burden she has to do to come and visit us as members. Mm -hmm. right? And then fill in the card. And fill in the card. <laughs> so this was a church, like the Ephesus church, that did all the actions, but the love, the love had disappeared it. from the church. They were like what uh, Paul said about the, the, uh, in the book of Corinthians, about the Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. He said, but... Although you do all these things, you know, you have signs and miracles and signs and wonders yes. and all these things happening, but yet <laughs> you have not love. It's yeah. just like a, a symbol. What did a you say? A dong. Yeah. yeah. That's what he said. <laughs> you have not love. And so uh, uh, there are many churches right now, and you're going to be surprised by what I'm saying to you. You know, a lot of the funny thing is, these churches believe they're full of love. Yeah. They're full of love. It's so busy doing work. But <laughs> do you get testimonies? Do you get testimonies every week? There's nothing like the love of God in this church, the way people love me in this church. Do you get those kinds of testimonies that are coming every week? Or does it happen once in a while? Amen. See, this is what you've got to ask. What we have done in our church, and our church is a full cosmopolitan church, mm. right? It's a full multiracial church. And, uh, and, and one of the things we have is when you come through the door, we have uh, a couple that, that greet at the greet door. You. And they have such a wonderful smile. There's so much of love in them. There's one elderly couple I'm actually thinking about right now. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when you look at them, they have so much of love inside them. Just they just hug you. you. <laughs> they just greet you. And you feel Christ when they come into, when you come into our church. You feel the love of God. And by that time, you're like, you, you're like sold out. This is my home. I love these people. <laughs> and, and when people start to hug you, you go hug everybody as well. Why? Even if you were never hugged before, all of a sudden you become that because the first thing you encounter when you come to our church is not the miracles. You don't encounter the word. The first thing you encounter when you come to the miracle center is the love of God. That, for us, is the most important thing. If anyone says, I have been to that church, the first thing they should talk about is the love they experienced. And that's what we see in all the testimonies we get every week. Yes, about the way life. people still, even in lockdown, the way people still care about them, the way people are still contacting them mm. every week to see if they're okay, yes, praying with them, encouraging you? them, telling them, hey, are you getting all pastor's messages, that he, what's up messages that he sends every day or every other day, uh, and, and, and encouraging them to read those messages because that's what, for many people, my WhatsApp messages is what's actually keeping them keeping strong, them, yes. keeping them strong yes. and, uh, and helping them through this crisis. Amen. So, a lot of, so they ask you questions like that and so on. And, 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 and that is so fundamental, the love of God. But there are so many high-powered churches, high-powered ministries, high-powered ministries that lack the love of God. I've been to some churches where I was even frightened to go inside the church because you take one look at those deacons and one look at, they're like mafia, you know, they're like the bouncers, you know, you get at the nightclub. Right? Yeah. yeah, I used to go to the nightclub before I was saved, right? So, you know, those bouncers at the nightclub, right? They were like big sized dudes and they would smash you up if you got up to mischief. Some of the, the, the ushers and the greeters at the door, the deacons, are like bouncers. You get frightened when you see them. You know, you don't want to do anything wrong in that church because they might just come and catch you and throw you out. Okay. So, there's a lot of churches that have all the other stuff. They work hard, but they've forgotten the love of God. And here Jesus says, not only have you forgotten that love, mm. you've forgotten to love me in the whole process. So, so he talks about, he says, I miss the love you had at first. That means Jesus remembers mm. how deeply in love we fell yeah. with him. Yeah. 
and he yearns for that love again. Yeah. He longs for that love again. So imagine this. Imagine. There is a well-oiled mechanism called the church. It's doing everything that heaven says it should do. Everything. Mm. It's even having praise and worship. But there's no love. There's no love for Christ. And a genuine love is missing from that environment. You see, when there's no love for Christ, you can't have a genuine love for the lost. Because yeah. the love for the lost comes, comes from, from a love God. for Christ. Jesus. Yeah. So... What Jesus is saying here is what happens in many, many churches. Many churches. People go to the church. Firstly, they, no one knows them. Mm. How can you be in a church where no one knows you? Where is the love of God? Yeah. Where is the love of God if no one knows you in the church? Where is the love of God? You should have, even if it's a mega church, you should have at least a dozen friends in that church at least a whole lot of people that know you. Even if you only go to church on a Sunday, don't do anything else. People are supposed to know you. They're supposed to know your name. If you've been going to church at least mm. a month, they should know your name. They should come and greet you. They should chat with you. That is a church with the love. But if you're just a number, there is no love there. It's all performance and no love. And that's what Jesus is talking about in the Ephesus church. All performance, all hard work. I mean, you'll see how hard the people work in the church. You can see how hard the ushers work. Yeah. You can see how everything is done with such, such great excellence. But Jesus is saying, where is your love? Where is your love for me? Are you looking for the limelight or do you want to love me in the process? So I want to, let's quickly finish this. Go, let's finish it. So the remedy uh, to revive the fire is three steps. Write this down. Number one. Mm. Step out of that spiritual turnaround. The first thing to step out is to remember. Is to remember your first love with God. Remember the day when you got born again. How you fell in love with Jesus. You couldn't get enough of Jesus. Man, every time you had a break, you'd go read the Bible. You'd talk mm. to God. You'd, you were working in the, in the corporate world. When it was lunchtime, you'd be sitting in the toilet praying, talking to Jesus, reading your Bible, yeah. right? Everyone else is busy, but you go sit in your car and you're talking to Jesus because you can't get enough of him. You are so crazy in love with him. When you go to bed at night, the first, the last thing you say is, good night, Lord, good mm. night. Oh, I love you. And in the morning you get up, you say, good morning, Lord. Remember that excitement, that first love? Where is it? You are never supposed to have lost your first love. Let me say this again. You are not supposed to lose your first love. You're not supposed to lose it. You're not supposed to lose your first love. That's why there were two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mm. And Jesus said to Martha, you're oh. serving me, doing so much for, for, for the kingdom, but you have lost your first love. Yes, you should do work for the yeah. kingdom, but it's more important that you keep your first love. Look at Mary. For her, she doesn't care about anything else. She wants to be with me. Yeah. She loves me so much. First love. First love. Wow. Amen? Amen? Amen. Isn't it awesome? Amen. <laughs> right. So. What do you do? You, you got to remember. Yourself. You got to remind yourself. Remember, yeah. right now, I want you to think back mm. to the day you met Jesus. Think of the excitement in you, in, in, your, in your life, in your home. Think of the excitement of going to church in the morning. Think of the ex excitement. You couldn't miss a single service. If now missing a service is nothing, then you have backslidden. Yeah, check your heart. You have backslidden. You are like the Ephesus church. You have backslidden. And so David wrote, he said, I remember when I used to go into the house of God. Oh, yes. And Very there's a song powerful. by the rivers of Babylon. Babylon. Mm. You know, it's really always, we said that, you know, it's always, you got to remember what first love was. Yeah. And now, it's the first step to being restored. It's the first step the Ephesus church had to do. They had to remember. Step two, they had to repent. Jesus wants us to see the seriousness of losing your first love. Losing your first love is actually sin. Let me say it again. You probably never heard anyone say this. Losing your first love, growing cold to God, growing cold to Jesus is sin. It's sin. Okay? Jesus even went as far as saying, if you won't worship me, you won't show me love, I'll raise up the stones to do it. That's how serious it was for mm. Jesus. That's how serious first love is, right? 
And, and when you fall out of love with Jesus, it's called sin. Okay? Many people are out of love with Christ. And today you need to repent of that sin. So remember the first love, then repent. Go back and remind yourself of what it was like when you first met Jesus, okay? Remember the songs you sang in your heart, how you would have new songs all the time. Remember that first love. Number two, repent. Uh, Jesus wants to see the seriousness of the situation. It grieves God's heart when his children fall out of love with him. Instead of drifting away, we turn around and we head back. Yes, okay. That is what genuine repentance is. Genuine repentance is when your first love returns, your first love. Number three, so number one is make is remember. Yes. Number two, repent. repent. Number, number three. three is to repeat the things we did first. So back when you first were saved, yes. what were the things that you did? Mm. We focus on the simplest basic things. Every night we said good night to Jesus. Every day we, 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 we were excited to read his word, to talk to God. Uh, we became so eager for for, for fellowship. Yes, right? and we would testify. We would testify all the time. Amen. We were not sophisticated Christians. We, were, we just loved God. We loved God and we were like babies. We were like children. So you have to repeat that again. Once you become a child and Jesus is everything to you, mm. he's everything to you. Now, now, you have made a full turn from the Ephesus type church. You see, Performance is nothing. Being a great singer means yeah. nothing. Being a great preacher means nothing. Being a great prophet or apostle or evangelist means nothing. If your first love is gone. If it's not there, if it's not there, all you do for God is of no value if your first love is not there. Jesus says, good, or it's great to do all these things, but there's a serious problem. You are, you're no longer in love with me. I'm no longer the, main, the most important person in your life. Amen. So, for 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2, it says, If I have the gift of prophecy, prophecy and, and can fathom all, all the, the mysteries and all the knowledge, and though I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. nothing. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. Mm. Ephesians 5, 18 I do not get drunk with wine that leads to the battery. Instead, mm. be filled with the Spirit, right? Mm. So, uh, uh, remember, it was easy to pray when the first love was there. Mm. Amen? It was easy. You know, sometimes I tell people, you need to spend more time in prayer. They look at me. What do you mean? I need to spend, you know, like, I mean, I pray for five minutes every day. Mm. Where is your first love? Where is your first love? Sometimes the mess you're in right now is because a long time ago, you lost your first love. You lost your first love. That's why you're in this mess. You want to get out of the mess first, find your first love. Then you'll be able to get out of the mess. Amen? Wow. So revival in our hearts doesn't come through some slick new seminar. Wow, what a powerful revelation. What a powerful message that you've just heard. So make sure that you stay tuned. You know, we still... Uh, talking about the book of Revelation. Make sure that you hear all these episodes. And if you miss any of them, you can go to our YouTube channel uh, at silvermodley.com forward slash YouTube and you can subscribe and watch all the amazing live streams and episodes. Also, don't forget to tell us how these messages are impacting you. It's such powerful revelation and we want to know how God is touching you right now in your homes. Amen. So stay tuned and remember... Miracles are normal. normal.